Alright, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah We're going to uh, resume the program with Q&A Our program officially ends at 5.30 uh, But uh, if there's you know, good questions coming in And you know, it's, it's beneficial for everyone we, we can continue Until Asr Asr is going to be at 6 o'clock Insha'Allah and um, I'm just uh, putting a disclaimer out there that if uh, we've already answered the question in the program, uh, we'll just reference where we answered this question again because we have you know, quite a few questions uh, coming in. So um, this will be open for anybody. So the first question is, uh, will uh, masjids continue to promote politicians, uh, specifically Muslim politicians, who openly support and promote and are at the forefront of supporting uh, LGBTQ. So I have a long answer on that, but I'm going to let anyone start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You know, not really sure how I can answer that particular question just because I think that it, probably every case is different. Um, but however, uh, it, it does remind me very quickly, so... Um, there was a, there's there's a well-known Muslim activist who's very um, open about her advocacy for LGBT issues, and some years back she actually did visit our community. Now that I think about it, and it's interesting because at that, that time I was not, you know, we're, we don't necessarily kind of apply a litmus test to people who come through the doors of the masjid or the seminary necessarily, but it's so interesting. So. One visit many, many years ago, a very short visit, and because of that one visit, someone associated me with that particular activist and basically said that I sympathize with her ideas from one visit years ago. And I didn't even meet her, by the way, okay? So the point is, is that if it's an official event at the masjid, then I think it is appropriate to make sure that the views expressed by that speaker reflect the values of the masjid, or at least if something's expressed that does not, that the masjid does not endorse, just be very clear about what is the purpose for inviting that person. That, that's what I would say. Also, very importantly, the private nasiha or advisement of that person is also something that the masjid potentially should undertake if they want to involve that person in an event. Okay, so I also have some, some thoughts on this because it's a very common uh, question. So this, is, this comes back down to political advocacy and what type of candidates we're going to support. So I think what needs to happen is uh, Muslim leadership or Muslim activist leadership, they need to have a very clear framework for the type of political positions and political candidates that they're going to be supporting or that they're not going to be supporting. And, uh, you know, Sheikha mentioned this book. It's one of the best books, maybe one of the only books, one of the best books on the subject, which is Towards the Sacred Activism by da Imam Dawood Walid. This is, a, this is a must read for anyone who's in activism. And what it's going to teach us is basically um, we can never support anyone or we cannot support any cause ever that's going to be against Islamic teachings. But what if you have a candidate who is Muslim or non-Muslim, but they're going and supporting causes that are against Islamic teachings? What do we do in this case? So what Muslims have generally done in the past, and we should admit our mistakes, is they said, you know what? We, just, we need a Muslim at the table. We need to have a Muslim in politics because it's going to be good for us because it shows that we're normalizing Islam and we might get a nice little iftar party at the city council or something like that and they might put up some you know, Eid lights you know, somewhere or something like that and you say, okay, that's all, that's all fine and dandy but what I think we really need to do is we need to stop voting for people based on their identity and vote for people based upon what issues they actually stand for. So if you take a politician, first of all, let's say there's a Muslim and a non-Muslim politician. We can say, okay, there's a scale of one to 10, 10 points if they agree with all Islamic causes. We'll give this person extra one plus point for being a Muslim. But then they support the environment and they're gonna help reduce carbon emissions. 
say, that's good, we support that. Alhamdulillah, they get plus one point again. They're going to support the issue of Palestine and the, help the Palestinians. We say, mashallah, great, we give them plus one point again. And the other person, they're supporting Israel and more funding for Israel. Points going down. But then they support maybe, you know, uh, some other cause that's good for Muslims. Uh, they support less military invention generally around, around the world. He give them a plus point for that. But then you go and you say, okay, what if they're supporting something that's affecting us and our children like LGBT? It's got to be a minus point. If not a minus point, maybe minus two, maybe minus three. So what we're going to do is we're going to vote for people based upon a very clear mapped out curriculum. If we're going to vote at all, that's a whole other you know, discussion. But assuming we are, we have to have some type of formula and say, you know, because most politicians, they either have like five to ten issues that they really stand for and they push for. And we need to weigh those issues and then we need to approach politicians from a position of power and say, you want the Muslim community's vote? Then you need to vote on our issues. You need to be with us on our issues. Not you come to the masjid iftar and you come in with your suit and tie and your dress and you look all fancy and you give like a Assalamu alaikum, I love Muslims. That's great. That's, we've had all that before. We've seen those politicians and then they stabbed us in the back and we didn't really get very far. So we need to stop this tokenizing of politicians. We need to stop thinking that just because someone is a Muslim and they're running, but if they're running on a platform that is actually not with Islamic values, I would rather vote for a non-Muslim who has more Islamic values that are going to change society for the better than a Muslim who has a Muslim identity, but they're actually going to change society for the worse. That's my short answer. All right, uh, next question. Can it be? What should we do if someone calls us cisgender? I'm sorry? Cisgender? <sighs> People can call, okay. What we should do if someone calls us cisgender? Do you want to explain? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so cisgender means that your gender is in line with your biological sex, which is everybody. So it's the opposite of transgender. So you're saying, so what they're doing is basically everyone is cisgender. According to Islam, there is no transgender. Everyone is cisgender, but they've invented a new term, and it's a really clever way. It's a very clever thing to do. Because now, if they say, well, you think transgender is abnormal? Well, you're cisgender. We made a new term for you. So you have your own term too, because you don't get to monopolize what is normal. So when you call, someone calls you cisgender, they're just basically saying that you're normal. You're the average, you're the standard, you are what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has naturally created you for. So you just leave it if someone calls you that. But if someone's trying to get you to use the term cisgender, then they're trying to modify your vocabulary. And that's where you need to be careful. I told you, all these additional letters, LGBTQIA++, and they're going to keep on adding letters. The only reason why it's being done is because they're trying to show that there's more power in the movement. And by adding 107 gender identities, it just kind of shows like, look, there's such a wide variety you want to go all the way back down to two or even three? No, no, we've gone way beyond that. So this is a really political tactic to redefine terms. And terms are going to de determine the way in which you view the world. If you look at the dictionary, t the Oxford Dictionary, the Webster dic dic Dictionary, 10 years ago, the word gender has completely changed. The dictionary definition has been completely changed from what it was 10 years ago. And versus what is 20 years ago. Now gender has actually no meaning whatsoever. So the invention of the word cisgender is a political tactic that unfortunately is going to happen, but we shouldn't be utilizing these tactics which are going to undermine the normal of what we're trying to promote. That's my view. Yeah, Jazak Mlahir for the question. In general, anybody when they ask you a question, you're not sure, ask back. And you say, what do you mean? And then you put them on the spot, right? And sometimes you do it not because you want to irritate them, but sometimes really you want to know where they are coming from because you don't want to right away judge people. So let's assume you sense is like what gender you follow, for example. And you're going to say, I'm a Muslim, and this is your opportunity for dawah. I'm a Muslim, and in Muslim there's only two genders, man and a woman, and smile and end of the discussion. That's it. As simple as this, don't get into arguments with people in general unless you really know your subject very well and you know how to defend it. Otherwise, you'll lose it. And especially if you're going to get emotional. 
And you, you know how we are sometimes, and the voice gets louder, then that's the time when you need to stop. Absolutely, you know, male and female. And then if they go back, like it's male and female, and then just move. And you know what? Ibadul Rahman, Yamshuna al Ardi Honan, the Khatabahum Jahiruna Kalu Salama. The servants of Al Rahman, they walk on this earth with humbleness. When the ignorance talk to them, they say peace. There's a question about when can we use pronouns. Um, I already addressed that in session six, so check the video for that. The next question, how do you advise people in the workplace respond to the request to take and complete required trainings to become an ally to the LGBT community? I'll give you a similar scenario. For me as an OBGYN, there is procedures where it's very common. For example, abortion. For example, tubal ligation. You make it clear from day one. You don't do it. Period. And you just say, I don't do it, I'm not comfortable, my religion, and that's my freedom of religion. Now you start using the words, they use it for the LGBT, use it for the same thing. As, as a Muslim, I don't do it. If they want to explain, I'm more than happy to explain. Personally, I've never had any issue when I, even when I worked in a Muslim country, I said that. And even I had colleagues who said, but we do it. I said, that's your choice. You know, don't get on there. I said, your choice, I don't do it. So when somebody comes in the training, and I say, this is against my religion. Against my religion actually is a strong uh, um, defending word because there is a freedom of religion. This is the beauty of this country. There is a freedom of religion. And you say, it's against my, uh, my religion. And, that, and again, calm, without looking down at people, just please forgive me, can't do that. It's against my religion. I keep hearing from progressive Muslims that Iran and Egypt have been offering gender-affirming surgeries. I'm looking for facts and clarity on this, please. Okay, so I can answer this one. So there was a um, fatwa given by Khomeini uh, regarding this. Um, and it's true that uh, there was a fatwa that existed and they were performing surgeries over there. There's a very detailed article written about this, explaining it in detail. It's by Brother Mubin Va'id. You can find it on Muslim Matters. And I was a consultant on this article as well. It is called, um, And the Male is Unlike the Female, Part 2. So there was two articles. This is in the second one, it's about 40 pages long, and he goes in detail about all the fatwas that existed that have been coming out, Egypt I don't remember, but Iran in particular, and then there was something about Sheikh Faisal Molawi uh, that he documented in a footnote, uh, but what my response to this was, just to clarify, so th these, are, these are not Sunni scholars, this is the Shia scholars from Iran, but Sheikh Faisal Molawi was the only Sunni scholar who had said something like this before he passed away, rahimahullah. And he is someone who I studied with his students uh, in France, part of my training. And I can tell you for sure, I very confidently say, if Sheikh Faisal Maulawi had lived a little bit longer and understood the issue properly, he would have not passed that fatwa. And that's why it's very, you gotta be very careful about people who've passed away and they've not had a chance to clarify what exactly they meant or the information that was presented to them. Because sometimes a mufti, gets a situation and it's presented to them and say, in this situation, can this and this and this happen? And they may say, well, if this is the situation and you're suicidal and this is what's gonna happen, well then, technically the rule says this and this is gonna be allowed. Did he have the research that the rate of suicide post-transition surgery increases by over a thousand percent? He didn't have that information available to him. So. There's, uh, you know, he doesn't have a chance to revise that. So just be cautious about some of these things that you come across and check out Mubin Vaid's article on that. Add something? No. All right. Uh, is it Islamically okay to read a book with a gay-sided character because I like the story? These are, these are interesting questions, aren't they? I, I, yeah, I know. I know these these are tough questions. I'm going to have uh, to be very honest. I mean, I've never read that kind of literature. Um, Sheikh, what do you think about it? Simple and no. Because why don't you love something Allah, Allah loves? Because that's the road. We never disobey Allah right away, right? If you see, and I'll give you an example from medicine. When you ask somebody, a patient, um, why do you smoke? Cigarette. 
most of the time, somebody around them is a smoker, a friend, a, a parent, a somebody, and they become what? It becomes norm. And then gradually they like it, and then gradually they do it. That's a slippery road. And you have to be very careful about that. You like it, you know, there's so many things we like, but we don't do it, it's not good for us. That's one of them. There's so many other things there that is beautiful, and you can like it. Why this one specifically? And the question, why did they put this in that story? This is how what's called, the, the, anybody of you, have, I've just recently been speaking with a lot of marketing people, and there's this called this, this the um, sublime messages embedded in there. So you need to be very careful. My advice is absolutely no. If I was a parent, I will not allow my child to do that. I will, but I will give an alternative to it. So personally, thank you, Sheikha. I do, I do screen the library books that my kids check out. Um, because they, again, they are interjecting these characters, these messages. And I, what's really interesting is that I've noticed this trend over the last few years. This is related to, to, to books and to culture. Um, the New York Times, especially now NPR, have featured um, basically Muslims that are filmmakers or they are screenwriters or showrunners or novelists. And often these are Muslims who identify as progressive or LGBTQ, and they're writing storylines around Muslims that are openly gay. And I'm saying to myself, what's what's happening here? And what's happening here is that the, the they are this is an attempt to normalize this for the Muslim community at large. That's what this is about. So NPR had a, a piece the other day, and what's really interesting is they, they, they kind of like, they, 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 they like that juxtaposition, i.e. that contrast of someone, like maybe a woman in hijab, and you assume, okay, she's wearing hijab, she's religious, but then she talks about her queer lifestyle and how she's writing a novel about that. So, the, and this goes back to the point I made about Muslims kind of rushing into the embrace of the progressive left. I mean, we really have to ask ourselves, you know, how has this ultimately served us? Because what, what happened is that Islam and Muslim were reduced to identities among identities, labels. An interesting cultural label along with the other labels. That's what happened. When would, <clears throat> when would it be recommended to leave a place where there is overt practices of the people of Lut taking place there? And that's another interesting question. I wish I had a little bit more uh, uh, background there. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I think the answer is very straightforward, but yeah, Sheikh. Um, in general, apply this on everything. When do you stop having a friend, let's say the friend drink? Let's say the... The, any, anybody who does something haram, when do you stop? Simple, when they start affecting you. Then the first effect on you is when you accept it. Once you accept it, then the rejection is gone. And then gradually, you're going to be accepting, maybe, do, maybe get, being around them with no issues, and then it may affect you and may end up doing it. So usually, as long as you, because the question usually comes, if I am not going to be with them, you're not going to be with them, who's going to change them, who's going to advise them? And this applies to everything. This is a very valid point. But once they start changing you, or you have, how long? I mean, I say, what is the deadline? What is the deadline for the change, right? If, if you're seeing small changes, that's beautiful, because some people need their time. But if there's no change whatsoever, and then your name is with them, and you're seen with them, then they will affect you at that one. Point. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it in the Quran to Rasul alayhi salatu was salam. We read it all on day of Jumu'ah. وَلَا تُطِعْ مَنْ أَغْفَلْنَا قَلْبَهُ قَلْبَهُ عَنْ ذِكْرِنَا وَاتَّبَعَ هَوَاهُ وَكَانَ أَمْرُهُ فُرُطًا Don't obey or follow the person who is heedless from our remembrance. Why is that? Because you will be like them. Is there a follow-up question? Thank you, Shaykh. Is there a follow-up to that? I mean, is this person... That was it. Okay. All right, it's easier for us to resist the rainbow movement, LGBT movement, rainbow movement, but how do we resist Muslim organizations that support the movement by endorsing politicians, endorsing Hollywood, etc.? It's very confusing to know what to do. There are. There are. So, um, so, okay, so she's, I'll, I'll tell you, the follow-up questions that Sheikh Haifa is asking me, are they majority, are they minority, are there Muslim organizations like this? I'll give a categorization for you. 
um, the ones who support and endorse politicians who end up supporting the rainbow movement, there are majority large Muslim organizations that do that. In terms of the ones who are awarding Hollywood writers and stuff like that you were just mentioning, those are the minority organizations, but they're not such a small minority that they're just in the complete progressive camp. They're at the level of being mainstream enough that they're masjid going people. So the question is, uh, how do we resist those Muslim, or what do we do with those Muslim organizations uh, that are promoting something like that, but they're not directly promoting it. They're kind of indirectly promoting people who may be promoting that. Is there some level of, is, are there some limits that need to be put in place? That's the question. Want me to answer? <laughs> so it's similar to, I thought I would just, just keep passing the microphone over. but So it's similar to this rating scale that I mentioned, right? is that oftentimes what happens is that civil rights advocacy, people have bought into the idea that if somebody is going to help establish Muslim identity as being a minority identity within America, it's gonna be very good for Muslims. And my view is that if we reflect back on that, how far has it really gotten us? How much has the identity politics or minority politics really done great for us in the past 20 years. So we need to ask ourselves that very you know, important question. And then we need to not be fooled into, so a lot of people who are in, in activism, they are swept up into this idea, which you should research if you can. There was, last night there was a talk on feminism and you know, some of this was addressed. So part of third wave or part of second wave, I forgot it was second or third, was it second? It was second, I think it was second wave feminism. They invented a term called intersectionality. Was that second or third? Maybe it was third, okay. Yeah, so it's called intersectionality. Intersectionality is basically this idea. It's based upon a philosopher named Michel Foucault who basically talked about structural power and dominance. Anyone who's in the social sciences department in a university knows exactly what this is. And the theory is this, all minorities must support all other minorities on all of their issues because there's a dominant power structure trying to oppress all of them equally. So most activists operate upon this assumption that we must team up with anyone else who happens to be minority because we identify as a minority, they identify as a minority, and therefore we must support each other on all, on all these issues. And that's the way in which a lot of activis activism is being done. That's where we need to change this framework. We need to say, you know what? Yes, we support Muslims' right to practice their religion. We support Muslims' right to not be you know, hassled and interrogated by the FBI. We support uh, Muslim lawyers coming and fighting for all of these things. But when we team up with another organization, we go back to the framework of towards sacred activism and we make a differentiation between an alliance and a coalition. And he mentions this in the book. And he says an alliance is where you team up with an entire party and a coalition is when you're talking, you're, you're teaming up on one particular issue. So what I think should happen is, if these Muslim, some mainstream organizations are supporting Muslim candidates as a candidate, as their whole agenda, then this is very problematic. But if they're supporting somebody because their politics adds up to those equations that I was talking about, this many plus points, there may be one or two minus points in there, but if they're overwhelming things are gonna be plus compared to another candidate, then we don't necessarily need to say, we need, must boycott that organization because they're not achieving anything. That may seem a little bit confusing, but that's my actually long thought out and peer reviewed you know, answer for this. If I, if I may, may add something, um, Sheikh Mustafa, I, th I think that the, you as the audience, as the Muslim public, as the, as the potential donors, can also go and say that we don't want to be taken for granted as donors to this particular organization that's going to uh, kind of promote this person that has these views. I think you actually have a right to say that. I mean, as an example, I was at a conference not a long time ago in a major city. This is a major mainstream Muslim organization. And they were highlighting Muslim politicians who just won local elections. And they brought this one person out there on the stage, and again, this is this idea of taking our Muslim community for granted. This politician publicly proclaimed 
that he never prayed. This is at a Muslim conference, by the way, conservative Muslim audience. And he just says very kind of happily, yeah, I don't really pray, but you know what, I've got a Muslim name, I've won this election, my wife prays, so just kind of accept me. And you know, people kind of politely chuckled in the audience. They didn't know, people didn't want to be rude or anything, but in reality, the fact that the organization brought him to begin with, because again, we're just so grateful that this Muslim guy with a Muslim name is now in the state legislature. Okay, but he also has an obligation to his constituents, doesn't he? So that's the role of nasiha, of, 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 of advisement, and also that organization should actually think when they reach out to the community for donations, who are they actually highlighting? What should I do if uh, I have a Muslim friend who identifies as bi but has not done anything about it? You answered. Yeah. I have. Yeah, so I did answer that. And uh, let me just clarify: this is an incorrectly worded question. If somebody identifies as bi, they just did something about it. They identified as bi, and in Islam, we don't identify ourselves by our desires. That's not a core part of our identity. So if you get easily mad, you get angry very easily. Do you identify as being an angry Muslim? I identify as an angry Muslim. If you're only attracted to tall Asian women, do you say like, you know what, I happen to be a person who's attracted to tall Asian women and I don't, I'm not romantically attracted to anybody else so therefore I'm stuck. You don't identify with being hungry. You don't identify with your feelings. So if you are identifying like that, you've already done something. And I addressed the rest of it in the, um, in the presentation. Is it, haram to, oh. is it haram to show my hair in front of a lesbian if I'm a hijabi? Very common and good question. I'd like to take this question if that's okay. So there are very detailed guidelines. If you open up a, a text of Islamic jurisprudence, ahkam or fiqh, you're going to see very, very specific guidelines. Uh, in the discussion on shurud sahat al-salah, the conditions for validity of prayer, sitr al-awra, covering the awra, they're going to tell you exactly what are the limits of the awra uh, for ma the male and female in different situations. And the most uh, uh, latitude, the most flexibility you have as a female is if you are in the company of uh, righteous, uh, believing women. In that case, you can be more relaxed. However, if they're even around Muslim women, they will say if there's any sense that there um, might be something in this person's character that's not quite sound, or they might go and describe your beauty to, to a male, then you actually have to cover and exercise more caution. And to be honest, I've, when I, I've had friends that have asked the ulama about this issue when they were studying, and, they, and they, I was really surprised to hear this, but they were really emphatic. They said she basically has hukm uh, al-rijal, that's what, that the ruling, the, the hukum, the ruling of this individual, it's you have to treat her as if she's male. And I said, well, wait a minute, this is a female, what do they mean by this? And the, the reality is they're saying, look, if this person has these proclivities, why would you uncover and perhaps uh, create a situation where there is some temptation or possibility of fitna? Now, if it's a family member, I think we have to perhaps treat it a little bit differently, but even, but understand this, in the, in the Sharia, even with family members, I have read these uh, positions, they say if there is any concern, this, there's something in this person's character, then you exercise caution and, uh, and you, you cover a little bit more. You know, the, the reality is that you want to safeguard yourself, your heart, and you also want to help this person out as well. So that's how I would answer that. I fully agree, absolutely. It's exposed. When is it okay to n not cover or wear my hijab properly? Is in front, of course, non maharam, this is agreed upon. Women in general, if there is any possibility that this person can go out and describe you, and I had it when someone described someone to me unintentionally, it was just by the talk, and I was like, subhanAllah. So I will de definitely lesbian, definitely. Um, whether lesbian, whether a woman, that you are not sure she will not describe you outside. I will not do it. And I will, they always play it safe. Always play it safe. It's much better. You know, when we say, you say in medicine, better safe than sorry. This is a very common thing in medicine. And I will apply it in my life also. You know, and I used to, 
perhaps be more flexible on this issue, but again, we have to be very careful, especially when we're talking about young people. You know, people can be, uh, can be influenced. I mean, I've even heard of situations where these are young girls that are playing together. And then as a parent, you have to actually come in and, and kind of watch things and be more careful because in this scenario, these were young girls playing together. And then one of the kids came and said, well, you know, uh, my friend is basically saying she likes girls. These are young kids, young kids. So again, we just have to be, I think, a little bit more aware of these situations. I work in Irvine Public Schools and the new rules is if we have not a non-binary student who doesn't want their parents to know about changing their identity in school, we're obliged to not to inform the parents, otherwise we will be fired. I tried to inform as many parents about this and I asked my boss not to include me in this if we faced such a situation, plus that I showed my objection to this new policy. Do you think this is enough? Have I done enough? Uh, or do I inform the parents and get fired? Let me translate the verse first. And this is in Surah Al-Talaq. Whomsoever is Allah conscious, righteous, Allah will open a way for him, makhraj al-exit, and there is so many commentary about the, uh, uh, the exit, وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ And Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam said there is an ayah in the Qur'an, there's a verse in the Qur'an, if the Muslims go by it, it will be more than enough for them. I think you did your best. I will recommend personally, try to find another job to be on the safe side. I mean, you did very well. You did all what you can do. You, uh, you publicly said, I can do that. But you cannot also be in a place and you don't follow the rules because that's not what you should do. I mean, the rule says you are not supposed to tell the parents. If you tell the parents you're not following the rules, now you're in big trouble. My, my answer is make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open another job for you. And may Allah make it easy. This is getting very serious, subhanAllah. Yeah, I'll just add to that. So it, it is getting serious um, and it's getting really bad. At the same time, this is a new law that was passed recently. And remember, laws can change, and laws can change sometimes very quickly. So I'm actually working with a Christian organization, Erin Friday, she is a lawyer. She organizes protests. Uh, she rallies people across the country. So she's actually working on uh, a new, uh, overriding this law. So it's very possible that you know, if the Muslim community mobilizes itself, and everyone else mobilizes themselves, and say, hey, this is not fair, to have things like this, you know, uh, taken out of parents' hands, this could potentially change even in a year or two years. If you look at what's taking place this last June, the atmosphere, people are speaking up more than they've ever done before. There are protests going around the country more than they've ever done before. And what they need is we basically need, I mean, the Muslims of Dearborn, the Muslims in, you know, Michigan over there, perfect example. They got, you know, material, whether you agree with it or not, they got materials out of the library that they didn't want in the library because there's like all these LGBT books and other very explicit, sexually explicit, I can say sexually because we put the 12 year old thing here. So sexually explicit books and all that stuff inside the library. Uh, and the Muslims in um, the other city, I forgot what it was, they passed a law. It's the first city to pass a law and saying you're not allowed to have flags besides the country or the state flag on any property, not government buildings. Uh, yeah, it was, it was in Michigan. Yeah, it was in Michigan. Huh? Yeah, was it was Ham? Ham? Hamtramck. Yes, Hamtramck. There we go. Not just on government buildings. All right, there was another place that got passed on government buildings. This is on any public property. This is huge. And that's because the Muslims got up and they were active. So if we do that, and we are involved, this is something that even is looking so bad, it's because most people have been asleep. People are waking up, and if enough people wake up, you have to remember we have two things on our side. Number one, we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on our side. And number two, I tell people, we have fitrah on our side. I had a story of a five-year-old, this is in my family, a five-year-old walked in, in, into a classroom, and they started pronoun introductions. So introduce yourself and your pronoun. So the little girl, she said, my name is 
you know, I'll just give you an example. My name is Aisha. And she's like, don't you, can't you see that I'm a girl? <laughs> she told her teacher, can't you see that I'm a girl? <laughs> said, Alhamdulillah, we have fitra. We have the natural disposition on our side. That's why people are pushing so much propaganda because they're fighting against the natural disposition that's built into every single human being. They have to fight all of that. So actually this can change very quickly. So never give up hope. Never give up hope and there's a way inshallah. So that's relevant to our second question. Next question. Is it possible to distribute the manual that I just talked about to the mailing list of the ICOI community and those who would like to volunteer to prepare and execute workshops about LGBT plus to the different age groups of Muslim kids? Who should they contact? So. Uh, I'll think about whether we'll send it on the mailing list or not, but if you want those resources, they're in the video, or you can email office at icoi.net and we'll send it to you. The second one is if you want to be involved. Like I said, you can help set up a class. One of the things that I get requests for all the time is there's a school board meeting and they're about to pass laws like this. They're about to decide whether parents get certain rights or don't get certain rights. They're about to decide whether this other teacher who's identifying as uh, whatever, uh, non-binary or something, whether they should be retained as a teacher or not. The parents that show up to that school board meeting make a big change if you get enough parents to show up to that meeting. So what we really could be doing is if Muslims rally together and say, hey, I'm gonna make, uh, this, just an example. I'm gonna make a list, I'm gonna get all my friends, I'm gonna put all my friends on there and say, whenever you're ready, you know, if there's ever one of those meetings we need to show up to, we're gonna go ahead and reach out to you or you know, somebody else who's involved in this and say, whenever you need, we got 150 people ready to show up at a moment's notice. Just give us a three hour you know, notice and we'll be there. And we'll say exactly, not whatever you wanna say, we'll say exactly what we're supposed to say. I have people actually writing the script for us. I have, alhamdulillah, I have, I have some of these Christian ladies, they literally write my script for me. I walk in there and I can read it. I recently had an OC Times, this is, I'm coming clean now. I had an OC Times register last week, it was published in the OC, OC register. And I have like a nice long quote from there. I didn't write that at all, I had her write it for me. She does an amazing job, this is what she does. People are there to do all of this work, we just need to be organized. But let me give you the caveat. The caveat is, Brother Amin's not going to organize this. And I'm not going to organize this. So if you say, you know what, how about this? I'm going to get you 100 people and send you all their names and you set up a WhatsApp group and you let us know what's going on. That is very inefficient. So if you want things done properly, make it efficient. If you come to me and say, hey, you happen to have these contacts. I don't need any further communication from you. I'm going to do all my own work. But whenever you need Muslim parents to show up and you got a script and you got everything ready, you just send me one message, here's my number, give me 24 hour notice, I'll get you 50 people at the meeting, I can do that. I can't, and he can't, and I see why cannot. Set up a tab on our website, set up a WhatsApp group, recruit the parents, send it out in the newsletter, follow up with all the people who put their phone numbers. We don't have the resources for that, but other people do. So if you organize it, organize it well, organize it properly with minimal other effort from other people. And I, am, I would love to be part of that effort. I would not love to lead the effort, but I would love to be part of that effort. So that's uh, my take on that. Want to add something? No, okay. We're almost getting Asr time. Yes, I mean, we got to stop right now. There is the fatwa. All right, so hopefully this has been a beneficial program. I'm going to ask... Both sheikhs to conclude with, or one of them, or both of them, to conclude with a dua before we, before we leave here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to choose for us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve the iman of our youth, of our next generation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us truth as truth and cause us to follow it and to show us falsehood as falsehood and cause us to avoid it. We say, رَبَّنَا لَا تُزِقْ قُلُوبَنَا بَعَدَ إِذْ حَدَيْتَنَا وَهَبْ لَنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَهَّابِ We say, our Lord, do not cause our hearts to swerve or deviate after you have guided us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow guidance on us 
to envelop our community in his mercy. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins, the major and the minor, those of which we are aware and those of which we are unaware. We ask Allah ta'ala to bless our teachers, our scholars, our elders, our youth, to fortify us in these difficult circumstances so that we fear none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah ta'ala to give all of us the most elevated niyyat because our Prophet said that that the, 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 the actions are by intentions. And also the Prophet said, peace upon him, the actions are by their endings, khawatim. We ask Allah Ta'ala for husn al-khitam. Wal wafata ala al-iman. Min ghayri mihna. So we ask Allah Ta'ala for the best ending. And we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for a, 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 a death that is upon iman. Or an ending that's upon iman. Without any trial in that faith. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not hold us to account for that which was beyond our control. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.